And so we'll begin to read at verse 3, noting that Peter is writing here to a particular people on the first theme in the first verse. He looks at the practical aspect. This is who they are. This is what their environment is. This is the pressure that is upon their lives. They are pilgrims of the dispersion. So pilgrims there literally means travelers. So that means that they have been uprooted and they have been forced because of the pressure and the persecution to move from their comfort and uh, from uh, all that they have known. And they're scattered now everywhere. And Peter is writing so that those who are scattered may be in some way brought together in fellowship. And it's always interesting to hear and to see how that even though we may not see much of each other, we may be far apart from each other, if we have common faith, if we share that faith in Christ, then somehow we sense, we feel, we know that we are together. And we meet up with one another, having been apart for many years, and it's as though we have never been apart, because our fellowship has been maintained by our oneness in the Lord Jesus. The second verse, he deals with the spiritual aspect of their lives. They may be in the world persecuted, but in verse 2, they are the elect of God. And it is this that the focus will be for Peter, not upon their common environment in the world, but rather in the common grace that has brought them into the family of God. Remember, Paul puts it well when he talks about the problems and the trials and the tribulations and the troubles and in his words, the sufferings of this present time, that is, in this earthly environment, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And here Peter is taking that thought and he's deflecting our thoughts from the environment around us and he's helping us to focus on the eternal issues that elate us, that lift us up into the heavenlies and help us in the mundane duties and demands uh, of our lives. And so we come down into verse 3 and he writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 
Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead, and give him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Amen. And we know the Lord will add and confirm his blessing to us in the reading of his precious word. Now, having looked at a little of the background of Peter and those to whom he writes, we want to move particularly into the teaching of verse 15 and 16, which brings to us the practical application of the grace and the benefits and the power that has been invested in the soul of the repentant sinner in the assurance of saving grace. You'll see in verse 9, receiving the end of your faith. That is the goal uh, and uh, the assurance, the salvation of your souls. That is the ultimate aim. That is the fulfillment of the purpose of Calvary, that the day will come when God's children shall be confirmed in the ultimate salvation of their souls. And we're looking a little bit of uh, that teaching in Paul's letter to the Romans. But as um, we are taken down through the um, chapter, you'll note in verse 13, there is one of those significant therefores. And we have learned uh, over the, the years that when there is a therefore, we need to just pause for a brief moment reflect upon what has preceded, and then follow through in what becomes, in the most part, the application of what we have already learned. Now, in the case of uh, Peter in verse 13 of the first chapter, we don't need to uh, investigate very much or very far beyond what we have read in the first 12 verses. It is what is contained therein 
that we're now invited, challenged, and exhorted to pay particular attention to in that, uh, as in the words of uh, James, faith without works is dead. So it doesn't matter what we profess to be. It doesn't matter what we uh, uh, may say that we have enjoyed of the benefits or the blessings of God. If the Word of God is not having an effect upon us and providing and performing a work within us, then the value of our words uh, is as nothing. There has to be the follow-up and the follow-on of practical conduct. If we are the children of God, then we need to live as the children of God. We need to be seen to be the children of God, and that becomes a very practical uh, illustration of saving grace. Verse 13, uh, Peter leads us into this, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. And that uh, term, gird up, has the thought of someone who, with their long flowing garments, uh, see the need for urgency or for speed. They will take up the end of uh, the robes and they will hold them firmly so that they are elevated to a point where they no longer hinder. And uh, that's the thought that is used here by Peter. Gird up the loins of your mind. Loosen your mind. Shake off, as it were, the, the, the traditions and, and the, the bondage of uh, wrong thinking in the past and begin to exercise your mind in a sense and in a way that uh, your hope is fully resting upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And here, of course, is the second coming of Jesus. This is a forethought of Peter. He's not looking back at the revelation, which they have already received, but he is looking forward to the revelation they will receive at the coming of the Lord Jesus. There are many uh, who are, are investigating uh, these truths, uh, referring to the second coming of the Lord Jesus, and many have spent long weary hours De debating, deliberating, and arguing over the, f the minute details of when Christ will return, how he will return, and what will be accomplished at his coming. And here Peter resolves the entire conflict of opinion about the second coming of Jesus by assuring us that when Christ returns, we will all fully understand and appreciate what that is. It will be at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, in verse 14, he adds, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. In other words, we have got to look forward and not back. We've got to leave behind the things that we once engaged in, indulged in, as we lived out and in and through our former lusts that were entirely bound up with the world. And we are now to refocus on the things that are before us, the things that we have been prepared for, the things that the work of grace and our salvation have now equipped us to be, things that we could never have achieved, could never have been, were we not rescued from the world and from the power of sin and Satan within our lives. So, verse 14, we are to put off, in the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans, 
the old man with his deeds. We are now to put on the new man because we have been crucified with Christ. We have died to the world. We are now alive unto God. So here then is our focus in verse 15. But as he who called you is holy. So before we begin to exercise our mind in the obedience of Christian discipline and conduct, we are to remember the cross. Here, Peter tells us, as he who called you is holy. The work of Calvary is a holy work. The application of the blood of the Lord Jesus is a holy work. That work of grace within your heart that forgave your sin and placed you into the body of Christ, into the family of God, that was a holy work. So now you have been called from the world of darkness, placed in the world of light. And as we begin to move from that pivotal point in our experience, the point of our conversion, our salvation, Peter now exhorts us, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. And then notice this little thought, in all your conduct. And the emphasis on this reference, while it does lie heavily on the word conduct, it lies even more heavily upon the little word all. So it's not just a pick and choose. It's not just a take or leave scenario. If we are the children of God, then obedience means full obedience. It means that with every effort of our heart, with every urge of conviction in our heart, we endeavor at all times and in all ways to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that all other things shall be added unto us. Christ must have the preeminence within our hearts and within our lives. There can be no other rival. We must not fall to the pressure and the lure of a lesser loyalty. We must yield ourselves entirely, totally to Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul is telling us in chapter 12 and the first verse of Romans, as we have noted in our Sunday morning studies. It is a full surrender. So here, uh, Peter continues to exhort. Here is the reason why we must endeavor to be holy in all our Christian conduct. One, because in verse 15, he who called us is holy. Then down in verse 16, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So, not only must we be holy because God is holy, but we must be holy because God has written it in his word. We have no excuse. We cannot say, well, we didn't know. God didn't tell us. It is firmly anchored in the Old and the New Testament. 
But this is the challenge and this is the calling of the people of God. Verse 15 puts in that uh, very strong, uh, not only recommendation, but requirement. Look at verse 15. As he who called you is holy. As he who called you, you also be. Now that is interpreted and it is bound up in Paul's teaching when he uses that little word, Christ-likeness. And he will describe that in a variety of ways, as we know. So the, the question then is, why should we be holy? And the answer, very simply, is verse 16, because God's word commands us to be holy. God has shown us his holiness. Now his word commands that we be holy. Just take uh, your Bible and turn back into the Old Testament and we, we'll go into Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 11. And uh, let's look at uh, verse 44 and um, 45. We won't take the time to go into the preceding verses, but you'll find that here in the book of the law, uh, Israel are being shown distinctions between uh, the things that are acceptable to God in terms of the uh, ceremonial uh, law and those that are not the clean and the unclean animals. And while that may not be as necessary for us to know today, it was of utmost significance and importance for the children of Israel. You'll find references, for example, in the 22nd chapter of Ezekiel's prophecy, where God indicts the prophets and the priests because they are serving the people in a manner that's pleasing to the people, but not pleasing to God. They have compromised the teaching of the law of God, and in the words of the prophet, they have put no difference between the clean and the unclean, between uh, the worldly and the holy. And you'll find that in verse 26 and 27, onwards in the 22nd chapter of Ezekiel. Uh, so it was very important for them to understand that as God laid down the regulations or the rules or the laws, uh, this was the requirement. There was a reason for it. Just as we have been given a set of laws to govern uh, our uh, society and the nation where we live, and uh, we're expected to abide by those laws because those laws have been sent to modify and, uh, and, and to, to some degree, uh, keep a, a sense of value and, uh, dare I suggest, morality within the nation that we live in. And the laws have a purpose. Now, we're very conscious, and I don't want to get into this tonight, but we're very conscious that man-made laws can have a motivation that is not spiritual and that is not godly. Uh, and we, we are sensitive to those. But when God gave his law, his law was meant to be kept. It was a requirement. It was the demand. And if you didn't keep the law of God, then you were in danger of all kinds of judgments or punishments and that not only meant that you could be held to task, but your entire family might join you in the punishment uh, for breaking the laws of God. Now, what is the intention of all these strict rules and regulations that God gives to Israel? And uh, without giving anything away, God willing, Sunday morning, we're going to be looking at this in the first uh, verses of Romans chapter 9. The things that God gave, gave, 
not inflicted upon, but God gave. And the word there is the same word that Paul uses when he talks about there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Paul received it as a gift from God eventually, not initially, but eventually. And one of the things that God gave to Israel was the law. Now, many died at the hands of the law. But the law, nonetheless, was a gift from God. And here is the reason why. Look at verse uh, 44 and uh, 45. For I am the Lord your God. We need no further reason. We need no other explanation than that. I am the Lord your God. Why should we obey God's law? Because he is the Lord our God. He has the right not only to be heard, but to be obeyed. So we read on. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Now, for the sake of time, we won't go through other references, but you notice in your study notes in chapter 19, verse 2, chapter 20, verse 17, the same thrust is put before the people. God demands holiness right from the early time when he led his people uh, out of the bondage of, uh, of Egypt. Now, going back into 1 Peter chapter 1, you will see in the 15th verse there a simple little uh, definition of um, holiness. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. We are to be like Jesus. That's what holiness means. Holiness is Christ-likeness. Now, just uh, come with me through one or two New Testament references to uh, confirm that. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Matthew 5 and verse 48. And you notice the interesting uh, interpretation or translation of the word here. Therefore, Jesus said to his disciples when he has lectured them on their failure to um, observe the laws and uh, leans heavily upon the Pharisees who uh, have a pretense of keeping the law, but inwardly they are uh, in breach of the laws of God. Uh, if you just go down through there, for example, um, verse 33, he touches on their tongue, uh, swearing and taking oaths. Uh, verse uh, 36, um, he reminds them of, of the frailty of, of the flesh. Um, he comes down into uh, verse 39, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. These are hard laws to obey. How do we approach them? 
you say, cautiously. Or you might say, reluctantly. But how many of us approach these laws obediently, energetically, enthusiastically? How often have we prayed, Lord, give me the opportunity today. Let someone slap me on the cheek so that I can turn the other cheek and fulfill your law. How many of us would go to that extreme and to that extent? Not likely, you say. Not likely, especially if it's that neighbor. If that neighbor slaps me on the cheek and there's no telling what I might do to retaliate. But these are the laws of God. And then we come down to uh, verse uh, 47. If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. And then he adds, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, if I were to ask you, how well do you keep the law? Would you say, perfect? How good a Christian are you? Perfect. Why? Because I'm holy as he is holy. See, that's the demand. That's the requirement. You say, well, yes. That's the ideal. That, that's what we attain Onto, but we all know that we're not going to be perfect until we get to heaven. Wasn't it McShane that prayed, Lord, make me as perfect as it is possible for a saved sinner to be? You see, that's the attitude. We may not be perfect. We may not be holy as he is holy, but we are striving to be as holy and as perfect as it is possible for saved sinners to be. Now, we won't go through any other references, but if you look at your study notes, you'll see in Luke chapter 6, Colossians 3, 1 John, and his little epistles, there are several other references that bring out this same concept the same thought. But let me uh, just take you over to Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. You say, well, how is it possible for us to even begin to show that kind of Christian conduct, to be like Jesus? How how can we even begin with that? Let's read from verse 2, 2 Peter chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. You'll notice that it, it doesn't say how often, what the multiplication is. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. As we noted on Sunday, there are two forms of grace. There is the grace that's sufficient. There is the grace that's abounding. Now, which grace do we receive in the fact that God multiplies grace to us? The answer is veiled, but at the same time, it's obvious. How much grace do you need? God's grace is multiplied. In other words, you will never, ever be caught short. You won't set out from one end of the swimming pool unable to swim properly and when you get to the middle, sink to the bottom because there's always grace there to keep you afloat and get you over to the other side. That's what this means. Whatever our need is, God has grace to meet us at the point of need. That means that if we are being dispersed, if we are being persecuted, 
if we have to flee from all our comforts, God's grace will always be multiplied to us. But it also means when I am reluctant to obey God's law totally and fully, and I feel the tug of the world holding me back, there will always be grace sufficient to help me break free and commit fully to my responsibilities in conduct as a child of God. Notice how Peter brings this through. We're still in 2 Peter chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Note, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. How does Peter conclude his little epistles? Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. So here is how we grow. This is how we enjoy the comfort and the courage of this multiplied grace. It is by seeking to understand and to know, to learn, about the promises of God. If we don't learn, we won't know. If we don't know, we won't grow. So here is how Peter again draws it through. As his, verse 3, as his divine power, now we're thinking here of the power of God, not our ability but the power of God, as his divine power has given to us, has given to us, not will give, but has given. The potential is there already invested in our heart and in our lives. It is not a problem of supply on God's part, that keeps us from fully trusting him. The problem is on our part. Here is what God has done. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him, we cannot escape this. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, Now here it is. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. They're great because God makes them. They're precious because God has given them to us. Great on God's part. Precious to us on our part. Now look at the next thought that through these you may strive to be like Jesus. Does your Bible say that? Look at it once again. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. What does that mean? That means like Christ. How can we be like Christ? Here the word demands and challenges and calls us. Be holy as I am holy. But how can I be holy like Jesus is holy? Colossians 1 verse 27 tells us. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory. How can I strive to be like Jesus? Well, I have less of me and more of him. I step from the throne of my heart and I welcome him as Lord over all. 
holy as he is holy. Now our time has gone and we'll have to leave this and come back to it, God willing, next uh, Wednesday night. But let me just conclude by pointing out as we go back into 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 to 19, how Peter gives two incentives for holiness. Verse 17 through to 19. And if you call on the Father, that's the first incentive. God is our Father. That's the reason why we ought to strive to be like Jesus. Remember what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8? We are heirs of God and we're joint heirs with Jesus. God is our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So the first incentive to holiness is the fact that God is our Father. But then notice the second. Who, without partiality, judges according to each one's work. That's the second incentive. God is our Father, but God is also our judge. So how then do we respond? Look at verse 17, the last part. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. What does it mean to have a godly fear? God willing, we'll investigate this a little further next uh, Wednesday evening. Let's unite now for prayer. Our loving Father, we continue to rejoice in your presence here this evening. We thank you for your word, your precious word. We thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus, the precious blood of Christ. We thank you for the rich promises of your word, the precious promises. And we thank you that in your love and mercy you have made us your children, your precious children. We pray that you will teach us your word. Give us an understanding heart. Help us to learn and to observe and by your Spirit apply the truth that we learn so that we may indeed live out our lifetime here in the fear of God. And grant that as we walk and talk, it will not just be the sentiments of Christianity, but the reality of Christ's likeness. To this end, Father, grant us your blessing tonight and in the coming days and until we meet again or until you come and take us home, may we live and love in the light of your purposes and in the honor of your name. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.